Please welcome to the stage, Lucas Foster. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I'm here to talk about, um, you know, Headcase, my company, and, and sort of what we're doing. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about how we interact or use um, VR in sports and sports training, sports recruiting, sports marketing. We do a lot of other things too, but you know, there's only 15 or 20 minutes to talk today, so I have to pick something. So Headcase was formed two and a half years ago. Um, it was basically a bunch of friends of mine who've been talking about you know, interactive storytelling for over 10 years and what we were gonna do. And uh, we formed the company just before um, the Oculus Rift was announced, so it was really good timing in a way. But we were, we were really interested in just, you know, ways to enhance the experience of storytelling. Fundamentally, what I care about is storytelling. I care about narrative and, and ways to make you have an emotional reaction to whatever it is we're asking you to watch. Our company consists of a bunch of, uh, you know, editors, DPs, directors, writers, um, what we used to call poindexters, um, you know, sort of socially inept, tech-friendly people. Um, and, uh, and engineers of one kind or another, industrial designers, um, people from the visual effects realm. And indeed, as a movie producer, the main thing that I do is I gather people who are smarter than me in a particular specialty and ask them to do their specialty in service of a larger um, imperative. And, you know, I don't need to be the master of 25 different disciplines because I can I can go find those people and I can hire them and I can put them together and ask them to collaborate. And, and that's sort of how I approach it and how our company approaches it. So I'm gonna talk about the tech landscape. You guys are, I'm sure, very tech savvy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tee this up in a manner as, so as to talk about how we use it in, in sports um, you know, performance. So you have headsets that are wired or tethered to some de other device, like a computer. Um, and there's, you know, the Rift and the PlayStation VR and the Vive and various other platforms that are, have a wire to, you know, something. There's mobile-based, um, uh, you know, dis delivery mechanisms, um, and those are, you know, the obvious ones, the gear um, and, uh, you know, everything to do with um, Google Cardboard. We're fans of just building an app and sort of having it be able to play without anything. Um, I, I want it to, you know, any content that we make, I want to have the widest possible um, viewing. And if you have to have some specialized piece of gear, I, I think that's maybe a limiting factor for a lot of people. So um, whatever we master for, and we master for all of this stuff, um, we also always make a kind of freestanding thing that you can use on your, on your phone or your iPad or whatever, and you don't need any um, headset to, to view it. And I think you're gonna see, uh, there's a lot of other people doing this, um, you know, there's various platforms that um, we're mastering for, but I don't think you guys really should care so much about the platform. I think ultimately it's about the content, and if the content's cool, you'll go to that platform, and if it's not cool, you, you won't. Um, so, you know, Little Star, or Google, or you know, the Steam store or whatever, does it, does it really matter to you where it is? You're gonna hear about it, you can, you know, search for it. You'll hear about it on social media or you'll Google it. Um, and then you'll go to that place or thing. So, we don't get too hung up on platforms. I don't really care. Whatever works best is, is you know, is fine. Um, and it's gonna change, by the way, um, you know, every, you know, every year. This is sort of a large set of topics. Um, this is how we approach stuff. So storytelling grammar, as I said, you know, we kind of, our main focus is on way, better ways to tell the story. The only reason I'm doing anything in technology is to find a better way to tell a story. That's my only objective. I don't care what the tool is. Tools are interchangeable to me, whether it's someone else's tool or our own tool. If, if the tool exists, I'll use somebody else's tool. If not, I'll build the tool. The grammar of, of VR is very different from movies um, or any other kind of entertainment medium or storytelling medium. So um, I, I think this stuff is probably obvious to you, but you know, a wide shot or a two shot or a crane shot or a dolly shot or whatever 
means nothing in VR. None of that grammar that's been established over the 80 years is, is useful in VR. VR obviously is, um, you know, as we're calling it, is a, is a spherical format. We're making the viewer a first person, um, you know, participant in this content. And the most important thing in the storytelling is to make you feel like you are actually somewhere that you're not. You know, in this context that we're about to talk about, I want to make you feel like you're a football player or a basketball player or a tennis player or a hockey player. I want to, or a car racer. Um, I want to make you feel like you are there, you are inside the experience, um, unlike in the rectangular formats where we're looking at you, we're, look, we're in a third person experience, we're looking at something happening over there and you know, we are the director, we are um, shaping the experience to, to give you a, a feeling or set of feelings. Um, in, in the spherical format, we're, we're putting you in the experience, it's like you are there, you're a participant and it, it matters actually where we put the camera. If the camera's too high, you feel like a ghost. If the camera's too low, you feel like a midget or you just literally feel disconnected from the experience. If we move the camera laterally too much, it'll make you ill. Um, we have a global shutter camera array that we built that's very expensive um, and that's to sort of get around all the issues with rolling shutter cameras of which there are many, you know, from GoPros all the way to the a, uh, A7 IIs. Um, whatever the latest version of the prosumer camera, those sensors are cheap sensors and they're rolling shutter sensors and they will make you sick. If you don't know what you're doing in this medium, if you don't do a lot of testing, you'll make people sick. One of the only, uh, we only have two rules at our company. One of those rules is don't make people sick. And the other rule is don't bore them. What we try to do in, in the storytelling grammar part is involve you in a way where you really feel like you're inside the story and, and, and make you feel um, comfortable there. Um, and right now that's short duration content. We can't really do it for very long. The, uh, actually the goggles are a big restriction. All of your eyes are two you know, different distances apart. The interocular distance uh, is different for you. you. Some people can't focus. You know, people who wear glasses may have issues. People get claustrophobia inside these headsets and it's, it's really uh, difficult to deal with. Women have um, inner ear issues that are more difficult than, or vestibular issues it's called, you know, that are uh, more uh, you know, pr prominent than men. So um, they get sick easier. So we have to be especially careful to test everything we do on women to make sure that we don't you know, make them ill. In the sports context, we're doing a lot of depth data capture. So we have a Velodyne sensor and another sensor, proprietary sensor on our camera array. We are capturing depth data in 360 degrees that goes along, that is synced via various means, time code being one of them, together with the, with the visual data. So later we can go back and I can, if we um, are doing a sports you know, training uh, evolution, I can go back and I can tell you how far that football was thrown, I can tell you the speed that it was thrown at, I can tell you how many seconds it was in flight, I can tell you how far away it is, I can tell you where the 50 yard line is in relation to the camera or the 5 yard line or the end zone or the goal post or anything you want to know. Um, we, can, we can do that today. Doing a lot of analytics on this data, um, so the, the performance of the athlete is kind of the thing that everybody is after and in the sports context, so we're, you know, very concerned with, you know, how the athlete is performing, whether that's a student athlete or a professional athlete. And um, we are providing a lot of, you know, data that maybe they don't know what to do with, so we are crunching that data for them. And, uh, you know, I have an engineering background, which I infrequently use to uh, surf the web and find interesting, interesting things. Um, and the, the, the analytics part is probably the most interesting part of this type of capture because, you know, in a movie or television context, we're not capturing depth data. We don't have a use for it. We might, for a visual effects shot, want to, you know, LIDAR a set or whatever. Sometimes we'll, you know, build a virtual set before we build the real set. But, but generally speaking, with live action photography, we don't really care so much about this data. In, in the VR context or in the 360 world, the data is very valuable, uh, in our opinion. So we are taking that data and we are ingesting it and then we are outputting it in various ways that are useful to coaches and useful to athletes. Um, we're also um, busy 
um, you know, it's very hard to see in, in 360 degrees when you're shooting. In our particular camera array, we turn the cameras on their side. So these are rectangular format sensors. Uh, there's 17 cameras on our, on our particular um, system, the head case um, VR rig. We turn the cameras vertically so that we get the stitch line to be above and below your face. Um, humans have a very good um, you know, perception of when people's faces are, are somehow you know, off. And obviously having a stitch line running through someone's face is, is not a, an ideal um, way to look at them. So when we turn the cameras on their sides, one of the things that happens is you, know, you can't really see. You stand, you're sort of in video village going like this and you can't really see what you're looking at. So we built live preview um, and it's basically a real time to a headset, to a mobile device, untethered, look at the, at the, at the world you know, in 360 degrees. We use that um, to confirm what we shot. Um, we use it um, at, with recorded data um, to kind of like do a preview of what we wanted to look at, which is to say we, we edit it. We edit the, the stitched, the rough stitched image. Um, and um, that didn't exist. We built the live preview software and stuck it in a phone and synced it to our camera. Subsequent to that, we built Live Stitch. Um, and the purpose of Live Stitch is obvious, which is it takes a long time and it's a post-intensive intense, process to um, stitch this footage together. You can imagine 17 rectangular images that are sort of overlapping each other, but really the pixels are not married. Um, so we use global shutter cameras, so everything is in sync and it makes it easier for us to cut it together and to automate that process. And without a global shutter camera system, very difficult to do live stitching at a, at a high level of quality. Um, our camera system is shooting a 7K by 4K ball, so it's super high quality. Um, we were just at NAB demoing live stitch um, last week, and you could walk by our camera and then you could um, download an app called VR Live and you could see yourself you know, in 360 degrees. And that's pretty useful, I think, in the sports context. You can imagine a, you know, a game environment or even a fan environment where um, you, know, you can see a game that you can't attend um, from half a world away in near real time. Um, it's a 10 second delay currently. We think we'll get that delay down to a few seconds. Um, maybe it'll be even frames later than we record the image um, eventually, um, you know, just a few frames later. That's just a CPU problem, a GPU problem actually. Um, and we're using super high-end graphics cards in order to crunch all the, all the you know, polygons that are necessary. Um, so um, wearable camera solutions I'm gonna talk about on a, on a specific slide. Haptic and sensory integration. That really just means touch. Um, you know, whether you are near a football or a basketball or whether um, it's um, something that you've lost control of, how long you've had possession of it, we can um, do with haptic sensors. And basically we're giving kind of touch feedback to a player in a jersey um, you know, as to how long they've possessed a ball or when they've lost control of the ball or whatever. Um, all kinds of interesting things can happen with, with touch feedback. Um, we're just starting to explore this. We've been doing this in, in um, performance capture in, in, in movies for a long time and we're just kind of adapting it to the, to the VR space. Um, Three-dimensional sound is really uh, you know, a topic I'm sure a lot of you already know about, but we record what we call spatialized audio. Um, it's sort of like a cousin of binaural audio and it's one of the problems that you have with the display device is a mobile phone really only can output stereo. So it doesn't matter if I record, you know, 70.1 surround, you know, it doesn't make a difference because I can only output it as stereo. So we've, we've figured out in the post process ways to make the sound more vivid. We call that spatialized audio. Um, we record it, we record, um, you know, full surround sound, 13.1 surround. But we, we really are outputting this kind of hybridized sound that um, makes you feel presence, um, what everybody calls presence, but is the best we can really do with a stereo output at this moment. I think that's gonna change. Um, there's, all, there's the OSIC um, heads, uh, headphones that just launched on Kickstarter and 
you know, raised $5 million. And there's, there's a lot of other audio solutions that are coming. And we think later this year, there's even another interesting one that's coming from a movie um, audio firm, uh, big, big name audio lab, um, that, that we think will greatly enhance the sound experience. And sound really matters in 360 degrees for obvious reasons, which is you don't know where to look, right? Sound is one of the ways that we can tell you where to pay attention and we can redirect your attention um, uh, with sound. So really what we're doing in the sports context is optimizing athletic training. And that's really where this is all going. You know, this past year, uh, we were hired by the University of Michigan amongst other schools to do recruiting. And so what, what happened was we would um, make a piece of you know, 360 video or several pieces of 360 video that coaches would use. They would put it in a headset. In the case of the University of Michigan, we skinned uh, Samsung gear. And we, um, the coaches would take that into people's houses and show them how the University of Michigan operated its football program. It also, you could see the law library and, you know, the Glick Fieldhouse, and you could see Schembechler Hall, and you could see every aspect of the university you wanted to see. It was a virtual tour of of an attitude or a feeling. And it worked very well. You, uh, Michigan got the number one football recruit in the nation. Um, probably not because of our, our footage, but it certainly didn't hurt. And, um, and Harbaugh loves it. And we're doing it again this year, except we're adding football training. And there's a, there's a fair amount um, to football training. I'm going to just race through it because I'm apparently talking too long. The virtual coach. So the main thing is we need to manage interactions with, with athletes. There's a lot of athletes on a, on a football team or a basketball team, and there's not that many coaches. One assistant coach might handle six or seven players. It's very um, time intensive, and they only have them because of NCAA rules for a very short amount of time. They're not allowed to talk to them at all times. So um, we're doing this virtual coaching program where we can basically take the coach after hours, off season, and, and, and talk to the athlete and give them what they need to know. Um, you know, a guy who's just a safety, his uh, free safety, his thing can be tailored specifically just to his discipline. And unlike what happens now where a coach is talking to a large group of people, even assistant coaches are talking to six, seven, eight people at a time. They can talk to one guy about his specific issues and, and help that athlete. Wearable sensors, we're building cameras into football jerseys and basketball jerseys. We're also building, um, you know, haptic sensors into them um, with battery packs and recording medium and all that stuff. Um, it's a little clunky right now, but um, it's going to get miniaturized, and um, it's a it's a big topic for us. We have an investor who's paying for this, and and uh, we think it's the future of all um, sports photography because you can imagine right now you have cameras on the sidelines or everywhere in the stands. You have a cable cam going over the top of the play, but wouldn't you like to be in the huddle? Do you want to see what the quarterback is? You know, maybe we don't give you the audio, but you can actually be in the huddle with them before the snap. And I think that's a very powerful tool um, for coaches and athletes. Game film, right now game film is shot from cherry pickers. It's like 100 feet in the air. Um, they, they make athletes watch hundreds of hours of game film a year. It's, it's soul killing. It's mind numbing. I'm not sure you learn that much from it. You're watching very, fairly small objects move around the field. Um, and we're putting that game film basically, we're giving you player point of view of, of game film. And um, we're, we're also experimenting with eye tracking. Um, we do eye tracking in the movie business and um, we, we should be able to tell you where a, a quarterback is looking. Whether he read a play correctly or misread a play or whether a wide receiver read that play correctly or a safety did. Um, we should be able to tell you with eye tracking. Um, we're also doing motion capture techniques and performance capture techniques. Um, Michigan has the Glick Fieldhouse, which is an indoor arena, um, and we're using infrared cameras to record um, you know, practices. And we're playing that back in a sort of motion capture sense or performance capture sense, performance capture sense um, to be able to give coaches a better view of what really happened than the ground level view. Education is a fairly obvious um, thing for, for athletics and, and a way that VR can enhance that is um, mental preparation, additional reps. 
You can only get so many hours out of your legs. You can only throw so many footballs. But you can virtually throw a lot of footballs or basketballs. You can virtually play as many plays as you want, as you're willing to, to do, and as, and as good as the content is. Um, you know, in the old days, a player would look at a playbook that was like a set of binders that was like 1,000 pages long. And I think these days, it's like 1,500 pages long at Michigan. That became an iPad version of the playbook where you're paging through play after play after play, and they frankly all look the same. Um, it's very different when you're watching a visual representation of that play and getting mental reps that way off the field. This is applicable to a lot of other disciplines, and we're using it in a lot of other places um, uh, for the military and in travel and other things. But it's particularly useful for sports. Recruiting is already established to work pretty well. Training we're doing now. Fan engagement is a big thing that is um, coming. We're talking to an NFL team about building a 360-degree um, theater where when you're in the stadium, you can walk into this theater and you know, be on the field and, and see basically what a football player sees. See the locker room, see the, see the coach, see the weight room, see all the athletic performance training and, um, that is going on and sort of get a behind the scenes look, if you will, at how football really operates. And uh, they think it's powerful and so do we. Um, in the movie world, we're doing that with a, a kind of a 360 IMAX theater that's going to be in China. Um, and there's some interesting other um, 360 theater environment, theme park type stuff that's going on um, that is very applicable to sports. Retail. Imagine that you go into a store and instead of just talking to a, a regular uh, you know, sales associate, it's LeBron James selling you a pair of shoes. He's telling you why you should buy those shoes, why he wears them, and, and you're having a first person interaction with, with him um, and, or any, any sports star in any discipline. Um, we're doing a pilot project that's exactly like that right now um, with a famous personality for a famous brand that's based in Portland. Um, and, uh, and, and there's some really interesting things coming on the retail side um, where a 360 view of it is a better simulation of how I'm going to use that piece of sports performance gear than, than I can ever get by just trying it on in a store or having someone or looking at an ad you know, a sort of a, a print ad. So I think that you're going to see retail experiences greatly change over the next couple of years um, here in Portland and elsewhere, where it'll be more immersive and you're going to, you're going to be, um, uh, you know, you're going to want to buy that thing that LeBron or, or Dwight Howard or whoever is, is selling you. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Kent Bai. I do the uh, Voices of VR podcast. It's a daily VR podcast I've been doing for the last two years. I've interviewed over 400 people uh, looking at this revolution of VR. And one of the things that I like to think of VR, just to contextualize it, is that it's like the Gutenberg press of the 21st century, where whereas books could capture information and knowledge for the first time, VR can capture human experience and give people a sense of embodied presence and really trick their mind into being into another world. So given that, I, I feel like uh, the internet is kind of like a marker. Of, we remember our times before the internet and after the internet. They're like, it's like a, a very distinct moment. And I feel like VR and AR is going to be that same type of moment that we kind of remember before VR and after VR. So for you, I'm just really curious to hear, like, what do you want to do with that sense of embodied presence, this new capability that we've never been able to have before? Yeah, look, you know, again, I, as a storyteller, my focus is on how can I make you have a better experience, a more memorable experience um, than, than you can have now. And one of the things, um, if you go to the Colosseum in Rome and you physically walk through that space, it, trigger, it creates a memory. And that memory is durable. It lasts and, you know, um, will stick with you and has more meaning. And right now, when you watch something on a rectangular, in a rectangular format, it's not really a good simulation of reality. It doesn't really trigger a memory in the same way. And I don't think it's as durable. So my interest in this medium, and I, I do agree with you that it's, it's like you know, pre-internet and post-internet. It's like the birth of television or, or the internet. Um, it's an entirely new way to communicate with people. 
And um, I think that uh, in, in trying to trigger an emotion in the, in the viewer, uh, it's a more effective tool for triggering that emotion and whatever that is, fear, sadness, you know, excitement or whatever. Um, and, and it's something that you will feel more vividly. Um, if I show you VR footage um, right now and ask you to recall what you looked at, and I, and I do the same thing with rectangular, you know, normal footage like on a television screen or an iPad or whatever, you'll have a very different uh, remembrance in, of the VR uh, experience. We've tested this for two years and people can really recall small details that they couldn't recall on the rectangular screen. So I think that's what interests me about it and that and the fact that we can do branching narratives um, and you know we've always wanted to do interactive storytelling and movie theaters and sort of television screens are, don't really lend themselves to interactivity but in this medium um, we can do that um, more effectively. Cool. I think I have time for like uh, one or two more questions and then uh, we'll have to uh, wrap up here but uh, in terms of that, for me, I think that VR, uh, the capability that it has for interactive uh, engagement, uh, it goes way beyond what film can do. However, there seems to be like this trade-off between, in, in film, you are passively receiving a story and you can really empathize. And the more that you engage and interact with something, then it becomes more of a game where it's more about your own personal exertion of will into an experience. And so it's a really challenging thing to be a storyteller and also add all this interactivity. And so for you, what have been some of the most, uh, uh, the best examples of interactive stories that you've seen using virtual reality and where you want to take it? Listen, I think most of the action in interactive storytelling is in gaming right now. Um, there's not a lot of live action, uh, you know, fantastic live action, um, you know, experiences to, to be had. Uh, I'm trying to work on that and correct that, obviously. But um, in a game environment, you know, for years and years and years, it's basically a spherical environment. You're using a motion controller, your thumbs, right, to look around and point your gun or point your character in a particular direction. And, um, you know, depending on your actions, you get a payload of some kind. Um, you get to advance or you get to go back or you, your character gets killed and has to respawn or whatever. Um, I think that um, we're seeing these sort of hybrid products coming along that are kind of part game and part narrative. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of that. I know of two really cool projects that are coming down the, the pipe right now. Um, that are fairly well funded, um, that are kind of hybrid um, experiences. Feels like a game, but is really a, a narrative. It's sort of like cutscenes come, come to life. Um, and you kind of get both, the best of both. Um, and I think you're going to see a, a lot more of that. Uh, you're going to see, you know, Madden football in full VR um, fairly soon. And uh, the final question, and I think we uh, have to wrap up, is that there's a company out there called Striver, and they're out of Stanford, and they essentially use these 360 cameras to record footage of football players. And so as a football player in college, you can only practice for like, say, 20, 22 hours a week, but they're able to watch this VR footage and get all this extra training. And so they've been able to do that and spread into the NFL. So I'm curious, it sounds like you're doing something very similar of just essentially taking 360 footage, using it for training in, in football. So why, why do you think, or how do you think you're gonna be able to compete with Striver and what is it that's gonna, if anybody can just put a 360 camera on a football field, then what is it that's different that uh, you would need a company like this? Yeah, look, in, in all humility, um, you know, Striver is a company founded um, by a football coach and a, and a football player, um, they're, they're not exactly um, genius storytellers. Um, they're, they're football players and they're, they're oriented towards really only football. Um, our company and some other companies like Eon and there, there's a whole bunch of companies are doing a lot of different sports, not just football. And they're also looking at it from more of, as I said earlier, from a storytelling perspective. How can I impart information in a useful way to, uh, uh, to an athlete, let alone a student athlete, okay? You're talking about a highly distracted, you know, very busy person. A student athlete has like no free time. I mean, literally none. They're like 24-7 in a, in a, you know, in a, in a prison of, you know, sports. 
whatever their particular sport is. So trying to fit a, a kind of storytelling uh, experience into their lives is, is challenging. And um, you know, other differences are, you know, I don't believe in the GoPro revolution. I, I believe in professional tools. I don't think it's, it's cool that there are you know, companies that have been formed to make sort of prosumer cameras and just kind of democratize the ability for people to photograph things. But that doesn't mean that you should use those. People make a mistake and think, oh, there's, I've got a camera, so therefore I'm a, I'm a director. It, it doesn't work that way. There's actually a fair amount of you know, um, knowledge and uh, you know, storytelling foo that goes into making something that people want to watch. I mean, you can go on, um, uh, you know, right now you can go on YouTube or you can go on Little Star and you can watch non a lot of non-professional content. And if you do that for like 15 minutes, you won't ever do it again um, because it's just, it's dull. So remember the rule I said, you know, don't make people sick and don't bore them. That's actually fairly challenging to do that. Running around with a GoPro ball stuck on a helmet is a good way to make people sick really quickly. Um, so there is an art to this and I think, you know, I'm not saying that we're the only people who have that knowledge. There are lots of other people who have it. It's all in the way that you, that you kind of put these things together um, that, that sort of, the, you know, separates the, the men from the boys, if you will. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. I think we'll have to leave it there. So we'll uh, go ahead and just wrap it up and move on to the next section. Thank so, you. Thank you.